Welcome to the October 19th, 2020 meeting. The meeting is now called to order. Please join me in looking at your screens to, um, for the image of the flag to be displayed. Please join me in, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. As a note, I am in the heart board meeting and we will take roll but I also have a number of uh, agency staff members here and um, we are distanced and therefore you will see my mask is off at this point all right staff would you please call roll absolutely thank you this is Danielle from heart chair Williams present director mechanic Director Mechanic? Director Kemp? Director McLean? Present. Director Overman? Here. Director Schisler? I believe you're muted, Director Schisler. Here. Thank you so much. <laughs> you do have quorum, Madam Chair. Very good. Thank you. Heart General Counsel Julia. Well, I am here. Dave McKen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Heart General Counsel Julia Mandel will read into the record the rules for committee participation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for your participation in this virtual meeting. The change of meeting location from in person at the Hart Administrative Office to a virtual meeting is pursuant to Executive Order Number 20-179, extending Executive Order 20-69 by the Governor of the State of Florida and Section 120.54 Florida Statutes. Due to social distancing, the boardroom for the eBoard Administrative Office is accessible only for personnel facilitating the meeting. Please keep your devices and phones muted when not speaking. Muting the sound and microphone on your voice will help avoid feedback. And if you're enabling your video camera on your device, please discontinue all personal conversations during the meeting. Please follow along with the meeting agenda and materials sent via email. All presentations will be shared on the screen while, while presented. Roll call will be taken in attendance for and for voting by hard staff. Quorum and voting results will be announced. There will be an opportunity for members of the public who have pre-registered with our staff to provide comments. General counsel will read into the record the public comment participation rules. During the meeting, please wait until after the chair asks for comments or questions from committee or board members for each agenda item as the meeting progresses through the agenda. If you want to hand, provide a comment or ask a question, please signal that you want to speak by activating the hand, hand button in the white circle next to the, your, to the name on your screen. The hand will turn blue when activated. Staff will read hands raised in order for the chair to acknowledge, and participant may unmute their advice and speak. Please speak your name before you comment. Presenters, please note all presentations will be controlled by hard staff. Ensure that you state your name, title, and company or organization for the record. Please say next slide when needed. Staff will progress through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I'd like to draw everyone's attention to page six of the packet to review the operations and safety committee roles and responsibilities provided for your information. The next agenda item is approval of our operations and safety committee meeting minutes from August 17th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved, Gil Schilfer. Thank you. Second, Richard Klein. Thank you. Danielle, will you uh, take the vote by name, please? Yes, ma'am. Chair Williams? Yes. Chair, K or, I'm sorry. Um, Director Kemp? Director McLean? Yes. Director Mechanic? Yes. Director Overman? 
Yes. Director Schisler? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone on the list for public comments at this time? Um, we do not have anybody who will be on the line. We do have a comment to read into the record when you're ready. I'm ready. Thank you. Okay. To Ms. Melanie Williams, Chair, and to the, Heart, er, to the entire board, my name is Letitia Jones, Heart Plus Operator and ATU Local 1593 President. I was reading the minutes from last month's meeting and I wanted to address two issues. Vice Chair Mr. Mechanic addressed Mr. Malloy with a question about response time. Recently, we had a Heart Plus Operator kidnapped and threatened. She was in Sun City staging, waiting to pick up her patrons. It was dark outside. The operator was forced to drive this person from Sun City to my mama. The operator called into OCC and stated she was heading to the BP in Y mama. She activated the EA button to notify she was in danger. The operator couldn't understand why was OCC continually calling her van after she activated the EA switch. Every time that phone ring, it agitated the person. It took the operator about 20 minutes to get there. It took at least 30 to 40 minutes for someone to get to her. Since this horrible incident, nothing in our SOP or verbally has changed in how we stage in remote areas and when it's dark outside. We continue to go in the area of Sun City and my mama and there are times when we have no service of communication. Our operators are out there to fin for themselves Daily in my prayers, I find myself saying, I never want to experience another Thomas Dunn. My second problem on Monday, we had the Route 6. The operator had a confrontation with a patron where he reached around the shield to do bodily harm to her. She activated the EA switch and OCC called her unit aggravate, I'm sorry, agitating the person. Hart had no one in the area to help her. A staff from Heart Safety and the Director of Transportation responded, it took about 20 minutes. This is unacceptable and I continue to ask management a question, when will the operators matter? Since these incidents, both operators are having mental and emotional anxiety. They continue to say, I thought I was going to die. No, no employees should have to come to work with the thought thinking, is this my last day to live? Mental illness is real, and that is what needs to be addressed in finding a way to protect our operators. The bus driver from Baltimore who was shot and killed last month for just doing his job. Letitia Jones, ATU Local 1593 President. Thank you. Are there any other comments? No, ma'am. That concludes public comment. Okay. I, I would like to comment on the, the letter. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that is not what we want our, our, our employees to experience. We want to make sure that they're safe and we can get to them as quickly as possible. The other aspect is if someone could alert me as to the EA process, is that supposed to be a, a call or is that supposed to be a person that, uh, that shows up right away? Do we know? It sounds like the EA, when the EA was activated, they expected someone to get there versus there being calls which would agitate the kidnapper and uh, I guess the other person that was confronting them. Um, thank you, um, Director Williams. This is Ruthie Reyes Burkhardt. Thank you. Um, the EA alarm is a silent alarm to the control center, whereas we can hear for X amount of time, um, so many seconds, I believe um, about a minute of where we can't speak to the operator, but we can hear what's going on in the background. Um, in that instance, um, our supervision contacted police and you know contacted 911. And so the next step would be, if we're not hearing from the operator, is to try to communicate with that operator to see if there's more information to be shared and. Um, I, I don't have a specific on whether they reached her or they didn't. I do understand that they um, were able to get information that she was asked to transport someone. In this instance, the way it would work is that we would try to reach out to the operator 
in that instance, if no answer, then we continue moving with getting um, law enforcement on the scene. And that is what happened. Okay, so as a result of the situations that were shared today, do we believe we need to reevaluate the process in certain situations where our call is necessary versus just direct uh, contact or sense of urgency? Of course, what you guys described uh, was done, but to get there immediately? And um, I think Colin would speak to this as well, that this operator through our training program um, reacted very appropriately and handled everything that would could be handled in the way it should with um, having gone through de-escalation training in the last year um, we feel that that process was followed to the letter of, of in the best way possible to get that operator home safely that day um, our controllers reacted in the way that they should in terms of reaching out to law enforcement and um, there was a, a very different scenario here because she was a moving, it, she wasn't standing in one location, she was moving. And right. so the location changed. We had to continue to track her until we could find where she finally came to a stop and, and police could get there. When she finally did, then she reached out to us. So we have evaluated the process, but I'll let Colin Malloy also thank you. speak to that. Uh, thank you. And um, as um, our interim CEO mentioned, um, you know, our operator safety is first and foremost the concern. So the letters that um, was brought up today, we show the same thing. There's nothing more important to us than the operator safety. We had a number of um, uh, events that took place that showed the success of some of the training and where we've come in the past year. So um, this was actually a million mile operator who is a great employee that we have here. and. Working with Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, the de-escalation training that the sheriff himself even taught um, provided these tools that allowed the operator to really de-escalate this situation from this non-heart passenger. This was not a heart passenger or a scheduled person. This was a non-heart passenger wow. that, that came onto the vehicle. And because of the training we provided, she was able to de-escalate. And through that coordination in the past year that we've built that relationship with Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, they were able to immediately um, be tracking the vehicle. And as soon as that vehicle stopped, that person was arrested. So one of the things I would say is the individual that was um, uh, involved in here was immediately arrested. He has a long track record. Um, and I think one of the larger things to talk about is we have a mental health issue in this community, and um, uh, our operators deal with that, um, as the letter stated, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this individual um, seemed to show characteristics of that mental health um, concern that is something I think as a community we need to look at, and it's something that um, our bus operators, our van operators, our employees deal with. Um, Hart's going to continue to look at that, what training we can provide to help them with it. Um, but in terms of the coordination with the police, our operators, the de-escalation de and the debrief, um, the team did respond really well. And um, it's, it shows that nothing happened. I think part of the work that we've put in this past year as an organization of where we were a year and a half ago. I certainly recognize the work that's been done as well. So I commend uh, the team and, and for getting the steps in place. The other aspect is I, I think it warrants just additional conversation with, uh, with, the, um, with Leticia as well as others from a committee standpoint to see if there are ways that we can improve our process for safety. And uh, um, Director, one, one last thing, on, on the second event, just to let you know, is um, we did actually, um, as part of the efforts and the leadership of this board and this committee itself, um, put additional security. So on the, the second event that was mentioned um, that occurred outside our net park location, we did have the armed security guard that although wasn't a heart employee, is armed contracted security. So those were additional resources that were not in place a year ago to help protect our operators along with the barriers. So we did have a security guard there that was able to assist the operator. And then both the manager of safety and security and the director of transportation um, responded as soon as they had the call as well. So um, we are working. It's going to be an evolving process. But um, I just want our operators to know that we um, are doing everything we can to make sure they feel safe and secure working for this organization. Thank you. Thank you. 
Director Mechanic, you're recognized. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I have two questions, and I'll ask them both for for some way, and because I think they may be interrelated. Um, um, Ms. Burkhardt said that the uh, the button that they push only allows the dispatcher to hear what's going on in the bus for one minute. Um, that that seems yeah. like okay. not not the best technology. I mean, it, it, it would appear if there's a true emergency, you would want that communication to be constantly open so that there would be more information being transmitted to the uh, dispatcher. And the other thing is I was confused by the, the commenter in that I thought she said that uh, they made numerous calls the dispatcher made numerous calls to the uh, driver operator, and I don't understand whether whether that's good protocol or not. But if there was an open mic after the emergency button is pushed, then there wouldn't be any need to keep on calling the operator. But I was confused. I'm not sure that's what happened. Go, go ahead. May I? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, the EA alarm allows for the open mic for one minute. The pitfall to that technology is that it doesn't allow direct communication. It does, uh, in other words, the op the the dispatcher can't give any instructions, reassurance, or otherwise to the operator at that point. Um, if the operator presses the EA alarm again, it again silences the ability to have a direct communications, hence why the controller was trying to call the operator. Um, it, it probably is something that we can consider looking at better technology. Unfortunately, our radio system is at end of life, and part of that EA alarm is attached to that radio system. HART does have in our IOC list um, a request for a new and improved radio system that would link us to the county's radio system, which would much improve the technology that's on board of our vehicles. But at this time, this technology is probably from 2008 is, or seven or so. It's quite old. Well, yes, yeah, so it sounds like we need to look into that. So, thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, Director Mechanic. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Uh, Director Schisler, you are, you are recognized. Yes, thank you very much. At the risk of belaboring the, the issue, and which I don't want to do, but I think it's, a, it's paramount to what, what we're here for. Okay. Um, did anybody review the whole situation with a law enforcement agency? Okay, this is what happened. This is what we did. This is, and this is how it ended up to see if we could make any improvements whatsoever to the overall process. It sounded to me like there, was, there wasn't much feedback, um, I'm just assuming, back to the drivers and to the, the, the union staff to, uh, <clears throat> to say, this is what we did, this is our best practice. Law enforcement or whoever said that this is the right way we, we handled it properly and there's nothing more we could have done. Or conversely, if there had been I, I, I think that the repeated phone calls would have scared the heck, the heck out of me being the driver because it's, you know, wait a minute, I'd say I have a problem. Um, I, would, uh, I, I, would, I would hate for that to, to, to become a, um, a, a flashpoint to cause a, a perpetrator of some description to do something bad to the driver. But I just wonder, did, did, did we review it? Did they offer any improvements or suggestions? And, if we got a good job, then we, we need to share that with with, um, with our drivers, with our staffs. Um, and second point, I, I'll, I'll get off the second. The second point is, um, I realized that the we have a lot of uh, important capital projects and, and wish lists, but I think this the the this proves that our radio system may need to bump off the IOC and move into normal. Um, uh, Capital budgetary um, processes, so there's some sort so of create some urgency for it. IOC stuff's basically at this point a wish list, which may never happen. But uh, we can move it into regular operations and see if this is 
is something that we can improve. It's not getting any better out there. It's, it, um, you know, <clears throat> more and more strange things are happening, and it may just get worse. So I think we need to, it's incumbent upon us to do everything we can to keep our drivers and staffs as, as safe as we can. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Director Schistler. Uh Director Overman, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I echo um, Director Schistler's comments when it comes to putting our, our drivers and operators, you know, paramount in terms of safety. So I was curious if what, what triggers um, or what do we have available to our operators and actually dispatch to when an event like this occurs to immediately address the trauma that occurs when someone is frightened for their life. Um, this, is, this is something that doesn't necessarily become the very first thing we do because we want to investigate what happened and want to make sure everybody's safe. But, um, you know, this kind of fear we've heard from our operators before, um, and I think it's critically important that we address the fact that anytime someone is by themselves you know, in, in a dangerous situation, that that trauma doesn't just go away just because now they're safe. So I'm curious as to what immediate response do we have for the, for the mental health and safety and trauma um, that's been, or trauma care that, that an operator and possibly the dispatcher may have had to listen to what was going on and not be able to reach that person. How, how would we help those individuals in the past and did that get activated in this particular case? Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, Commissioner Overman. Yes, we immediately met with that operator um, and our human resources labor relations manager met with her as well. We referred her to our employee assistance program. Um, we, you know, discharged her to, to some time off in order to take some time to um, for her to reach out to the emergency uh, employee assistance program and um, we have followed up with that employee on several calls and we are just making sure that she is getting the help that she is required and that is what's done for all employees in any incident um, in a matter that Revol revolves around an incident where they feel that they need to speak to someone or they may not feel that way initially but we certainly encourage it and it's offered to all of the employees and with respect and I, to and I, and thank you for that response and I appreciate that response but just as we call law enforcement because we believe their crime occurred I think it's important that we have a trauma person that actually can walk through what that person is experiencing and hold their hand a little bit so they don't go, I don't need it, um, and walk them through that process. And I don't know whether or not your HR staff is the, the right for folks, but I think that immediate response is important to recognize that that safe place needs to be honored and respected and necessary. So I, I, I don't quite know. I know that people who deal with trauma are well trained at that, and I'm not sure that the in-house staff is going to the best person for that for that situation. I'll that up to you guys to figure that out, but I think it's important to recognize it's a, it's a very important process. Yes, ma'am. We will have our interim chief people officer, Crystal Hunley, um, reach back into that um, topic and see if we can't find a resource there for our employees to manage that with and and just going back if I may to Director Schistler's comment um, the radio radio system is also on our legislative priorities list um, at, so not just on our IOC list so that if there were funding available um, perhaps through that process we may be able to move that project a bit further along sooner thank you attorney and our CEO um, thank you for your question uh, are there any other? Oh, uh, com Commissioner Kemp, you are recognized. Oh, yes. This, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, too, if um, barring getting that funding for the radio systems, um, if there's some kind of interim fix at all that we can at least try to explore or, or possibly. Um, I uh, do, just for this one issue. 
what I think I am going to. Um, I don't know. They, I'm thinking that you don't know the answer to that right now, but I'm just asking if maybe we could do that. That's a good question, Commissioner Kemp. Yeah. Thank you. I think well, at, this time, we're, we, at this time we're. Uh, or Queen Asa, we want to go on mute, please. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your feedback. If we if we could ask everyone to go on mute, we're getting a lot of um back up. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and your uh, uh your care for our hard employees and staff for the actions you've taken thus far. I'd ask that we evaluate the process. Number one, uh, evaluate our opportunity to improve the EA technology and where it is on our priority list. And then af for an after action event, I'd recommend we understand uh, the tools that are available for the employee and the rest of the staff um, so they could learn from that experience as, as well. It, and would you mind bringing that back to us during our next meeting? It's just that serious. Thank you very much. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Chair, Director McLean. Direct, Director McLean, you're recognized. Yeah, great recommendations there. Um, one thing, when we look at the after action, and I'll reiterate with what Director Schistler said, I think we need to go back to the authorities also and, and see if they can provide any kind of um, insight into how well we did or how well we didn't do uh, and, and incorporate that in the after action report, um, if you will. We acknowledge that request and we'll add that as well. Thank you. This concludes the public input section of the meeting. Hart General Council will read the closing statement into record, please. Ms. Mandel. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for sharing your comments and participating in the virtual meeting. Please continue to listen and view the meeting at the Hart YouTube channel at www.youtube.com user heart transit. Please note that when the public comment call is ended, a brief pop will play, but no meeting participants will, will and meeting participants will be disconnected. Um, so please disregard the prompt. Thank you. Staff, please discontinue any public comment. I'm sorry, please disconnect any of the public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kemp, your hand is still raised. Are you Are you wanting to speak at this time? Okay, all right. We're moving to the presentation. Thank you. We are moving to the presentations, and first, the carbon copy, carbon footprint, foot, excuse me, carbon footprint comparison for diesel versus CNG versus battery electric transit buses. We will have a couple of more readouts as well, and we have some action items. And recognizing we have another meeting at 11 o'clock that will start, I want to make sure we, we give it the thorough attention they deserve, but understand we also have um, the strategic committee meeting um, immediately following. I'll hand it over to Michael Graves, our environmental program manager. Mr. Graves, you're recognized. Well, thank you. Good, good morning. I'm Michael Graves, environmental program manager here at our Riverside in the project management office. Uh, next slide, please. This morning, I'll be giving a carbon footprint comparison of diesel, CNG, and battery electric transit buses. Next slide. To facilitate this comparison, I utilized a carbon footprint model, model calculator developed by the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory. In the past, TARTS used their Greek model. I used the successor, AFLEET. It's a little more robust with updated emission factors. Um, next slide. Uh, both of these models are widely recognized and respected for vehicle carbon footprint calculation. One reason being emissions are calculated on a well-to-wheels basis. And what that means is it includes both upstream contributions plus vehicle operations. And the upstream contributions are referred to as, as well-to-pump. This would encompass uh, fuel, feedstock, recovery, processing, production, transportation to the dispensing pump, or in the case of electric vehicles, to the charging station. And then pump to wheels represents the uh, vehicle operations the so-called tailpipe emissions. Uh, next slide. 
And it's important to calculate and compare petroleum use, greenhouse gas emissions on this holistic well-to-wheels basis because activities upstream of vehicle operations can use significant amounts of energy and subsequently produce large amounts of emissions. Uh, next slide. This slide shows the um, uh, petroleum usage in barrels of oil calculated using a fleet for a diesel, CNG, and battery electric bus after 50,000 miles. And that represents approximately one year in Hertz fleet. And as you can see, the petroleum use in barrels of oil goes, went from 341 to 2 to 1. So as you switch from a diesel to a CNG or a battery electric bus, you, you've effectively eliminated reliance on both domestic and foreign and crude uh, petroleum. There's still some you know, very minor upstream contributions, but um, you've, like I say, you've effectively eliminated um, petroleum usage. Uh, next slide. This slide shows um, greenhouse gas emissions for a diesel CNG battery electric bus after 50,000 miles calculated using a fleet. And as you can see, short tons greenhouse gas CO2 equivalents goes from 189 to 148 to 59. So as you switch from a diesel to a CNG bus, you realize a significant reduction. And then as you go to battery electric, the reduction is even more dramatic. And while battery electric buses do have zero tailpipe emissions, they still have upstream contributions. And in the case of battery electrics, the, the largest upstream contribution would be due to the emissions from generation of the electricity that charge it, the bus's batteries. But as the um, electric get grid becomes cleaner or carbon neutral, you know, that too will, will continue to shrink down. And to, to get a better handle on this, I, uh, I talked extensively to Tico about how do we generate the power in the Tampa uh, market. Uh, next slide, please. And fuel sources for electricity generation, Tico Tampa Electric 2019, 90% was due to natural gas, 6% coal, 4% solar. And Tico said going forward, you can continue to expect coal to shrink and solar you know, to grow appreciably. And I also talked to Tico about well, the, the source of the natural gas. Uh, is any of it renewable, you know, from uh, landfill gas, biogas? Uh, next slide. And uh, sources, natural gas, Tico People's Gas, 2019. At present, the only sources of natural gas that Florida is receiving from the main transmission and interstate pipelines is shell gas. Uh, Zero percent, you know, recyclable uh, gas. Currently, there are no other sources of natural gas supplying the main system. The natural gas is obtained from wells in the Gulf of Mexico or inland from Texas and Louisiana. But uh, Tico did note that going forward, they plan to um, infuse um, re renewable gas, you know, biogas, landfill gas, in, into the transmission pipelines. Uh, next slide. But before I take um, comments or questions, I wanted to mention a, a, a recent partnership project um, Hertz under, or, or undertaking with TECO. TECO recently approached us to do a, a CNG fleet case study and video production, um, and we, we accepted. And, and just some of the high points, Hertz will provide the CNG fleet data and metrics. TECO will provide the case study and video production. The project will be completed during October, November, December. TECO is going to fund the project 100%. Both parties must approve all final content you know, prior to distribution and use. That would include both the fleet case study and two videos, a 90-second um, long form and a, an edited 30-second uh, shorter form video. And then both parties will receive full usage rates. And then once we get our battery electric uh, pilot program up and running and get some experience with it, we'll uh, hopefully do a, a similar uh, battery electric uh, you know, fleet case study and video production. 
And with, with that, I'll, I'll take any comments and questions from either, either presentation. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Director McLean, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Michael, thank you for the, um, for the update there on the carbon footprint. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to hear that you're working with TECO um, in, in doing this upcoming study. Just a question. Um, the upcoming study, while it looks at carbon footprint and the use of CNG versus electric, is it also including operational costs associated with either platform? Well, the the uh, CNG or the um, the partnership project is with Pico and People's Gas. It, it the intent was for it to be a, a CNG fleet case study because we've been using CNG vehicles since 2014. So we have a a, a large amount of data, so we can do a, a very thorough fleet case study. In you know, okay. at all different types of you know, costs of um, maintenance and operation and. Okay. Yeah, and Michael, that's what I was getting at. I, I just, as we look at carbon footprint, as we look at electric versus CNG, I think one of those areas we definitely need to look at is the overall cost of using either platform and how that plays out in the coming years, particularly with our tight budget right now. So, yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. We we don't currently have any experience with battery electrics, but others do, and I believe uh, Scott Greenville is going to uh, speak to that in his presentation. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Director McLean. Any other questions? Wait, I can. Oh, I can. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Yes, just because I heard Thank that you. brought up, so I thought this was going to be Scott's presentation. I had to walk for a minute, but um, so Scott is going to bring it up. But I had asked and specifically looked when it was brought up to me in. Um, uh, privately to go through it because I've been very concerned about this, but just for clarity, the um, electric costs are the equivalent of a dollar seven a gallon, I think was what I uh, looked up and did at the time. And they are, um, and I'll let Scott um, uh, uh, present that, but they're um, the. It, Everywhere, the cost savings in terms of that, that is the sell point. Um, it's the initial investment and then the cost savings. Hey, hey, Commissioner Kemp, this is um, Director McLean, and, and hopefully you don't mind, Madam Chair, but um, Commissioner Kemp, my biggest concern is really the upfront cost. Uh, it's not the operating cost, so to speak, but the upfront cost. Um, which my understanding are substantial, um, and particularly when you look at a system like Hearts that doesn't have any capability right now at all. So that's where I was going with that. So thank right, you. Right. Sorry, it's just that those are paid back uh, by and large in, in a few years with the lowered um, electric cost of, uh, of the vehicle charge, and it really um, uh, makes sense. In terms of that, because uh, you can also, uh, with the, uh, um, uh, the operations, the, the uh, gas costs also, I expect, <laughs> I think by, I can imagine within a couple years that um, the cost of the gas is going to rise tremendously. I can see that happening. There could be carbon uh, impacts, and this is a long-term uh, decision, and, you know, there might be a carbon tax. Um, any any number of things that would impact and grow the cost of the electric the, um, or the gas. The other thing that we can, of course, do is provide our own electric and do an initial investment in that um, through solar, and that would be uh, that would be um, really wonderful. And um, I expect that that's what a lot of places are doing. Thank you for your feedback. I believe we do have more uh, presentations on that subject, so we will incorporate it later into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graves, for your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Molloy, you will provide us a monthly safety and security update from June to August 2020, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this um, monthly update is actually incorporate, 
uh, June, July, and August. So we're going to go over three months worth of data to share with this board. So next slide. Um, so again, we'll be talking about kind of our accidents, but we'll also be going over the verbal and physical assaults, um, action items. Um, but we did want to share with this committee um, as well some um, recognition and some um, recent awards that the agency has received as well, so the committee is aware. And then um, obviously open up to any questions you may have. Uh, next slide. So looking at June, July, and August, um, the accident rate has really been very static for us coming through this period of June, July. Um, the one thing that we did see in August, though, was an increase in low dollar value fixed object um, collisions. So they represent the majority of the type of events that we see. So to share with this board, um, when someone was asked what type of event does heart kind of see when it comes to an accident um, on the road with their buses. It really is these low dollar type of mirror clips or the, the mirror hitting maybe a bus stop sign or some part of a small thing that uh, normally has very low uh, direct cost to the agency. And we have seen a little bit of an increase in that in August that we're tracking right now. Um, I've spoken with my safety team that reviews each one of these accidents. Um, they work with the training department. There is a um, individualized coaching that takes place with each one of these individuals um, when they have an event. Um, what we're finding is a lot of it is distraction. Um, these are small numbers in terms of our overall service level, but um, just at that moment in time, maybe the operator was a little bit distracted or might not have been paying attention as much. So we're working with them, coaching with them. Um, we have quarterly trainings I talk about in our action items. One of the things we're talking about with them is um, you know, staying focused on some of those small things. But again, they're very low dollar value, um, but uh, we have seen a small increase and the root cause seems to be the um, uh, kind of the manual distractions that we see. Uh, para has remained constant as well as a streetcar. Um, next slide. In terms of security, I'm happy to report that, you know, we have, again, through this period of time had no physical, actual physical assaults where a patron has put their hands on an operator. You know, um, so we've come a lot in this year and it's kind of um, in one of my slides further on this presentation uh, show how Hart was recognized for that, but we've had zero physical altercations. Um, we are seeing some of these verbal altercations that are taking place and a lot of them have dealt with masks issues between different patrons and um, a number of them have kind of gone from offensive language to threatening language. So um, we are seeing some of that verbal, um, and that's where that de-escalation training becomes very, very important and that coordination with the police. So um, again, no physical altercations, but we are seeing these verbal um, altercations that are taking place, and a lot of it has been um, really around kind of some of this mask usage. Um, next slide. I'm going. So I wanted to make sure that we keep this committee informed about all the events that HART as an organization is doing when it comes to safety and security. So at the very beginning, we talked about the accidents. Every single accident we have, there is post-event training that takes place with whether it's a supervisor, safety department training. It's one HART, one team helping our operators out with that. You know, our, our COVID hurricane planning has been ongoing. Um, ops and safety and the entire team has been working on that. Um, we've continued with, you know, toolbox talks. Um, one of the unique things is that we have been working with the Transportation Security Administration on security protocols as well as leading up to the Super Bowl. Um, one of the things we did have was a workshop with TSA on August uh, 26. Uh, the quarterly safety trainings are taking place. Um, again, as part of our coordination on response times and working with police, we had briefings with District 3 uh, of Tampa Police. Um, so Hart staff actually went to all of the roll call briefings for District 3, which is downtown Tampa, um, which serves like our Marion Transit Center, the Marion Transit Way, Channel Side Streetcar. So we actually went to each one of their morning briefings and talked to them about coordinating with Hart with our riders and how we work together as one unit. Uh, those took place both sub, um, September 22nd and 29th. And I'd like to thank Chief Dugan and the um, uh, Major Johnson, as well as Captain Owens on helping set that up. Um, we also, at the federal level, had the FTA State Safety Oversight Virtual Workshop on some of the regulations. 
Um, that leads into one of my other presentations later today about the um, safety management systems. Um, again, TSA uh, finished a security assessment report for us that we've been speaking about at previous board and committee meetings with you. Um, that was received on October um, 8th. So that is an action item and deliverable that was completed. Um, this week, we are working with FRA. So the streetcar division and ops and safety are working with FRA and CSX on testing on the interlock. Um, our supervisors, TSA is coming in to do training with our supervisors, our road supervisors, on a TSA created program. So outside entities are coming in to help with a First Observer Plus training program with them on October 23rd. Um, one of the things I wanted just as a deliverable to this committee to let them know is that, um, I believe it was Director Sichler who brought this up first, but how do we make our committees work better? You know, how do we evaluate what we're doing? And we've made those modifications where we've actually brought together a joint health and safety committee member working with ATU so we get their concerns out better. Our next scheduled meeting of that new modified committee schedule is November 10th. And then we have a tabletop exercise that's actually gonna go through kind of looking at how our procedures work, how we respond to things in preparation for day-to-day -day activities as well as the Super Bowl. And that's scheduled for December of this year. So I just wanna share with this committee that in the background, our managers, our supervisors, our staff here at Hart, day in and day out are working towards constant process improvement to make this agency um, safe and secure for our employees. And that leads into a little bit of the next slide is that, you know, all the work that, you know, from the action items from the past year, we were, um, I don't want to say surprised, but it was very humbling that the state of Florida the Florida Public Transit Association actually recognized HART as the Bus Safety and Security Excellent Award winner for 2020 for all the work that our frontline staff has done, our managers, our leadership here, and I'll be honest, the board of directors. So if you look back at this past year from getting the barriers installed, the de-escalation training, the review of policies and procedures, working with Tampa PD on our dispatching center, um, the Ride with Respect campaign, the symposium that we did, all those things were recognized by the Florida public as, as really first in class in this state in tier one. And um, I just wanna thank all of our employees um, that really made this happen. Uh, we didn't go into it looking to win any award. We went into it to make sure that our employees feel safe and secure. And um, it was a pleasant surprise this past two weeks that we were, we were recognized by our peers for all the work that we're doing. Um, also, TSA, you know, I went through all those different items that we've been doing in the background over this past year with the Transportation Security Administration. Um, the federal director for our, the Tampa Bay region um, actually provided this letter to Hart just to thank them for their continued um, dedication to security and working with them on helping secure surface transportation in this area. So um, I just want to make sure we shared that with this committee. Um, one of the things that's been great in this past year is having this Operations and Safety Committee is that we're able to provide this information directly to you guys, keep you informed, and, um, and get your insight and advice on things maybe we need to do better and come back to you on what we need to do better and, and work with you on making sure that this is a culture of excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Excellent um, progress in the uh, number of altercations and also recognition of the award on behalf of all of the HART employees. Thank you. Do we have anyone um, with questions at this time? No questions, we will keep moving forward. Mr. Malloy, I see you're a presenter of, of item C, Human Trafficking FTA Grant Award. You're recognized. Yep, uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, so this presentation at the last committee meeting, um, we were asked to kind of give a, um, is it the PTAS with the human trafficking? I think we're in human trafficking. As she gets that set up, at the last uh, committee meeting, we, were, um, we shared with the committee about some of the work we're doing on human trafficking, and we were asked to follow up with this committee on what exactly that entitles. So that's what this presentation is about. So um, next slide. Um, so I'm gonna talk about FTA 
Um, the grant in terms of, uh, as well as Hearts Award, the external partnerships, training, um, outreach, and any questions that um, they may have. So next slide. So again, human trafficking is a national issue. Um, FTA, USDOT has made this a priority for transit uh, because of its unique role within this environment. And through that, they have put together a program called Put the Brakes on Human Trafficking. And HART uh, actually applied for this grant. Um, we knew that the Super Bowl was coming up. Um, and it has been a critical area. We've heard back from our employees and in the Tampa Bay region that this is something that HART is being a community stakeholder. We can help provide some solutions. Um, Prior to COVID, we were moving over 40,000 people every, 35 to 40,000 people every day. That's a lot of eyes and you're touching a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And we can be part of that solution because we're members of this community. And I'm happy to say that the work that our grants department did, our communications department, we were actually awarded the largest grant in this region for human trafficking to put together a program. So um, uh, the next slide. So once we received that grant, we really wanted to work with external stakeholders, and that was part of the grant was reaching out to groups such as the uh, Tampa Bay Human Trafficking Task Force, um, you know, with the city of Tampa. And the task force, one of the groups they really talked about in terms of it was this um, organization called Sailor Freedom. And on the next slide, I'm going to show with you some of the things that, that, they're, that they're doing. But the Sailor Freedom was recognized by the Human Trafficking Task Force of Tampa Bay is really best in class of how to provide information on, you know, signs of human trafficking, um, what to do when, when this occurs, what are operators, they see something, what should they say, how do they respond, and we brought subject matter professionals in for this. Um, we also worked with the city, and um, we look forward to opportunities with uh, Hillsborough County in terms of, I know, computer-based training that they have, how we can extend that out to our employees as well, because, again, this is a community, um, um, initiative. Hart's part of this community and we want to be part of the solution at a community level. So working with these external stakeholders is, is really the way to get success for it. Um, next slide. So the training has already started and um, just to share with you kind of a personal perspective, you walk into the room and you hear this testimony from these individuals from Sailor Freedom that are providing this training. It is so empowering what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, working with law enforcement, nonprofits, your community groups, your faith-based groups of how they get in there and help people that are caught in this vicious, vicious circle. And I can tell you our operators are really engaged in this. One, they see this, they want to be part of the solution, and seeing the interaction between, you know, if it's a member of Tampa police that's presenting or St. Pete police that's presenting or someone from a faith-based group or a community organization talking about this issue and sharing real life examples, it's, it's really engaging. And we've had so much success in these quarterly trainings. And I just wanted to show you some of the pictures of just deliverables of what's occurring out there. And the trainings are ongoing. We're gonna have over 40 sessions. Sailor Freedom is coming in over 40 times to hit our operators to make sure all of our employees get this training and again, this goes back to if they see something, this gives them the best practice of what to do, what resource to provide, and how to most efficiently do that. So we're really excited. I, I'm passionate about it. I hope my voice kind of comes across because it really is a empowering <laughs> thing for this community. And I'm just, I'm so happy that our team at heart here had the foresight of applying for the grant and we're just seeing some of it come into fruition. Um, next slide. And then our communications and marketing team. So we're doing this training, we're going over our procedures, but you're gonna be seeing a rollout of this immense campaign as part of the grant. So we're gonna have buses that are gonna be wrapped. We have, I think, 20 buses. Um, you know, we have our chief of marketing here um, who can speak a little bit even more in depth on it, but we have buses that are gonna be wrapped in Spanish and in English, interior cards, audio messages, we're going to have, you know, onboard creatives, you know, radio spots, graphics, video, public output. So you're going to be seeing this huge push leading up to the Super Bowl where Hart is really going to be engaging on this community issue. And um, it's, uh, it's one of those unique things that transit's able to do because we touch so many lives. 
that go beyond sometimes of just moving people from point A to point B. We could be help saving someone's life at that time. So um, I don't know if, if Jackie, there's anything else you want to add. Maybe I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know your team's working really hard on the the outreach and you know the communications plan. Thank you, Colin. Jackie Haldo, Chief of Communications and Marketing. We're excited to uh, unveil this campaign in the coming months. Important to us was to ensure that all of our employees had gone through the training, because before we start advertising the 800 number and the services locally, that our employees know how to care and have concern for anyone who may contact them on board. Um, so we're going through the training and creating the design um, so it makes sense to our employees when they're, if in case they're contacted. So more to come, uh, but we're really excited. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I do just, um, Hillsborough County has a really great program as well. They have a computer-based training that we, we want to leverage as well for um, our employees as well. So we'll be, we'll be looking to push that out as, as well. So um, I believe... Um, uh, Again, a very important program and open it up to any questions, but we wanted to make sure that we reported back to you guys on what we're doing in the realm of human trafficking and how we're helping to assist. Thank you. That was a very good presentation. And in the forethought to think about bring, having Super Bowl come in where there will be a large number of people and then to think about how it will infuse our economy. In addition to that, there are some really bad things that could potentially happen, and to be ahead of that is just profound. So thank you for that insight and getting the employees up to speed so they will be aware of that. Thank you. Do we have any questions from our board members, committee members? I, I, have, a qu I have actually have questions and comments. All right. <laughs> this is Commissioner Overman. Co Ms. Co <laughs> Commissioner Overman, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you. I, I forget I have a director's hat on instead of a commissioner's hat on. But I actually do have a chair's hat on when it comes to human trafficking. And um, Colin, thank you very much for your report. And um, Ms. Haldell, I, I do need to meet with you guys if you haven't already. Um, the Commission on Human Trafficking has been asked to act as the convener with the NFL for the Super Bowl and is coordinating with the Tampa Bay Task Force, but, but also with Visit Tampa Bay and an organization called um, It's a Penalty, which is developing the marketing campaign for um, addressing Hillsborough's program of Hillsborough Heroes Against Human Trafficking. Um, there's logos and color themes, and um, the marketing campaign of Hillsborough doesn't buy it. Um, there also, that partnership with the commission has been with uh, the sheriff's office and, and Cell of Freedom, and I believe is part of that solution, so there's a good, good crossover there. And our training program is an online program, so uh, it's available to all of your employees at no cost to allow all of your employees, in addition to this special training that you're getting from Sale of Freedom, um, this is a way of allowing your employees, especially those new or onboarding, to have access to who do you call, what do you do, you know, what does it look like, and why is it important. And this also covers not only sex trafficking, but also labor trafficking. And that is a very important when a lot of our service industry that may be in a situation where labor trafficking is a, a risk to them, you know, your, your operators will see those individuals and, and recognize what they're looking at. Um, but I do encourage you to reach out to uh, Heather Curry. She can connect you with, it's a penalty for coordination of the marketing campaign. So there's some similarity and, and sustainability of the efforts that are being done to participate and be prepared for the Super Bowl, but also because the county's um, human trafficking efforts are designed for sustainability. We're also in the process of developing a local hotline number. Um, the, the 800 number goes to Polaris. It's a wonderful organization, but frequently having a local number allows for rapid response an improvement on um, enforcement and um, allows for a 
quicker opportunity for prosecution to be able to stop the crime um, immediately. Um, then actually connect those victims that have gotten in this trap with the services and support that they need in order to move on with their lives. So I, I thank you very much for moving forward on this. Um, please feel free to contact my office to get a connection with the efforts that are being put forth by Visit Tampa Bay, it's a penalty, and the commission on building a marketing theme uh, in the area of fighting against human trafficking. So uh, thank you very much for bringing this forward. And I, that's why, one of the reasons why I was looking for the report, because our marketing campaign is launching probably within the next 45 to 60 days, if not sooner than that, uh, actually. And so um, working with the heart and making sure we have a consistent message, I think, is, is very valuable for not only the operators, but also for the public. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Director Overman, for your additional comments, and I'm sure staff will connect with you on how to, to, how to go forward and lead this effort, including the marketing aspect. Um, Mr. Monk, Loy, you are also on the next agenda items for committee action items, so if you will move forward with A, approve the Hart Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan and Certification of Federal Transit Administration. You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will move quickly for the sake of time. As um, So this is an update from a topic that we've been talking about through this committee um, over a while. It's the Public Transit Agency Safety Plan. Uh, next slide. So again, I'm just going to give a real quick background. We've briefed the committee on um, the PTAS and SMS, um, but just talk again about why it is required, the timeline, and what our next steps are. Next slide. So again, just background, um, Congress required that operators of public transit, they had to move forward with this new safety plan um, that's called a Public Transit Agency Safety Plan, or PTAS, if you hear that acronym. It's codified in federal language. They have to use this new framework that's called SMS in terms of developing their safety plan. It was actually, Hart was in line to do this in um, uh, June and Jan June and July of this year, but to COVID, a number of agencies were not prepared, so they pushed the compliance back to December 31st. Um, next slide. Um, again, SMS is a new way of looking at safety. Hart's been doing a lot of these things to begin with. The existence of this committee is an example of it. Safety reporting, you know, to leadership is an existence of that. You know, the resources that the Board of Directors has provided is an example. But it's a new way of engaging safety to make sure that it's really at, it comes from um, leadership as well as policy, and we're looking at risks moving forward. Um, next slide. So again, just for information, um, it requires that there is a safety officer uh, the plan does require by federal law that it's signed by the accountable exec. And the reason we're coming before you is that it requires that the board of directors signs off on the safety plan. So what we're asking here is just to move forward. I think on the next, if you can go to the next slide. Um, what we're asking really is to take this to the November board meeting, the public transit agency safety plan for board review um, so that we can then in December uh, sign off to it with an FTA. But to give you a timeline, this is not something that we've just haphazardly put together. Uh, we've been working on this. Um, we did a gap analysis. We put together a transition plan. You know, we've been updating this committee through um, in January and May. You know, of, um, we've been working with FDOT in reviewing our plan to make sure we're meeting all guidelines. Um, we did another, you know, we're presenting now um, to hopefully move forward with the, uh, the board approval in April, so, or in, um, in November, and then that gives us a period of time in December to, to sign off. So, um, next slide. So, um, I believe what the committee action item is, is the, um, we have a recommendation that the Ops and Safety Committee um, approve the Public Transit Agency Safety Plan and certification to the Federal Transit Administration and advance this to the full Hart Board of Directors meeting at November 2nd. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Is there a motion? So moved, Your Honor. Thank you. Second. Oh, Thank you. Danielle, will you 
take roll, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please say yes or no after your name is called. Chair Williams? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Mechanic? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schistler? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The next action item is will be presented by Mr. Drainville. I believe he has the next two action items. So, Mr. Drainville, will you please, uh, you'll recognize and please move forward. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. Scott Drainville, Deputy Chief of Maintenance and Facilities for Heart. Uh, this presentation is an overview for the purchase of 16 compressed natural gas buses that would replace 16 diesel power buses and also the purchase of four battery electric buses that would stop Hodge's long-awaited battery electric bus program. Uh, next slide. So we're recovering Hodge's current active fleet and immediate needs, uh, cost comparison between CNG and diesel, uh, Hodge's battery electric bus pilot program, some charging infrastructure, the results of Broward County's battery electric bus demo, some statistics uh, from Star Metro, initial cost and service comparisons, and a timeline for the purchases. Uh, at the end, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, but following this presentation, I would ask this committee to uh, review and follow the two action items to the full board on for November 2nd approval. Uh, next slide. So currently, Hart has 183 transit buses, 113 diesel, 70 CNG, but 79 of those diesel buses have met their use for life. Uh, but with the uncertainty of Hart's financial future and the amount of actual miles Hart buses operate, it's imperative to get Hart's capital replacement plan for a rolling stock back on track. A pre-COVID service, hard CNG buses average 62,000 miles annually, and that's 20,000 uh, miles above the industry average. With the funds identified and approved in our FY21 capital budget, we are requesting to replace 16 diesel buses uh, with 16 CNG buses. Uh, some of the immediate benefits uh, once in service are the highly cost efficient, uh, over, overall more reliable service that improves the customer experience. Uh, not only technicians, but operators are familiar with the vehicles, and no extensive changes to inventory. Next slide. So in this slide, we're showing a comparison between the first 10 buses in our 2009 diesel fleet, uh, 2901 through 2910, and these would-be buses that would get replaced uh, to the 10 2019 CNG buses for FY20. Uh, if you total operating in fuel costs, the 10 diesel buses totaled 447000 compared to the 10 2019 CNG buses uh, at 182,000. There, there was also 1,957 more labor hours recorded on the diesel uh, compared to the CNG. So overall, the CNG fleet ran 142,000 miles more uh, in FY20 and was 62% cheaper to maintain and operate. Next slide. So in August, how was awarded an FTA 5339 bus and bus facilities grant for $2,742,675. Uh, it does require a 50% match. This grant allows high funding to purchase battery electric buses with the requisite charging infrastructure to stop the battery electric bus program. Uh, the plan is to purchase four Proterra 40-foot transit buses with a minimum of 425 kilowatt depot charges, uh, with options for two 60 kilowatt depot charges for the maintenance shops and one on our charger for the Marion Transit Town. Uh, how would you utilize one or more state contracts uh, for the purchase? Uh, total cost not to exceed $5,485,350. Next slide. So here we want to show a visual of the you know, actual charging infrastructure. So the top right photo shows a 125 kilowatt power control system, or PCS, with two dispensers that plug directly into the bus. Uh, the dispensers can be installed up to 450 feet away from the PCS. The bottom left photo shows a 500 kilowatt power control system commonly used uh, for on-route charging. And the photo in the center is a bus being charged on a route. Uh, a 7 to 10 minute charge would provide an additional 20 to 31 miles, uh, depending on the route and the duty cycle. These charges are currently compatible with most major battery electric bus manufacturers. Next slide, please. So earlier this year, Broward County conducted a battery electric bus demo with, with the four major battery electric bus manufacturers, BYD, New Flyer, Proterra, and Gaelic. 
Uh, some of the highlights, each bus ran between 18 and 25 days and between 10 and 12 hours a day. Uh, when you look at the ranges from an ops and maintenance perspective, this is the most concerning. Uh, hot buses average uh, 208 miles a day, some routes over 300 miles. Uh, if you look at both average and maximum range miles, all are well below Hutch daily average of 208 miles. Uh, and if you go down to see average efficiency, uh, two kilowatt hours per mile, that's pretty much the industry average uh, across the uh, country. Next slide. So we reached out to Star Metro uh, asking if they could provide any monthly stats or information about their battery electric buses. And they were kind enough to send us their August uh, electricity usage and cost. Uh, so they have 19 battery electric buses. Uh, they've been in service between 2012 and 2013. So in August, they ran 18,485 miles at a cost of $15,541.28. And their cost of mile was $0.84 cents a mile. Uh, if you look to the right, uh, the four colored boxes break down each of their charges. So the green box or their Apple Yard is showing their six depot charges, DC1 to DC6, uh, and the remaining three on their on route charges. Uh, the costs are all inclusive. So there's taxes, there's fees, there's peak, there's demand. That's everything. Uh, that's why you see the 36 cents on the Apple Yard. It is, if you look at that, that, that is high. Uh, a lot of the talk is about the fuel savings. Uh, and that's the, the biggest concern that my team and I have been talking to the, the agencies around the country is really talking to the utility companies before we get the project started and see where we land. Uh, because some people get the impression because uh, the average is 11 cents, we won't we'll be paying around that price. And here you can see it's it, it's a lot different when you add all the, the taxes, fees, and demand in, in the actual price. Uh, but when you compare that to Hot's August 2020 CNG comparison, uh, our 2009 fleet ran 38,422 miles, but under 10,000 at a cost per mile at 23 cents a mile. Next slide. So let me show the initial cost and some service comparisons on the battery electric and the CNG buses. Uh, these figures do reflect recent quotes from each vendor with high specific configurables and specifications. These figures could change slightly whether up or down during pre-production meetings. The new 40 foot CNG bus comes in around 533,000. The Proterra 40 foot battery electric bus just under 921,000. Uh, but with the battery electric buses, we also must purchase and install charging at this point. So I will be purchasing one depot charger per bus with the options for the two for the main shop and the iron ore charger for the main uh, That will be about a million dollars for installation and infrastructure. But we look at some challenges in our knowns. Uh, limited driving range, 150 miles between full charges. Uh, recovery time between three and six hours. Uh, infrastructure development, some technician and driver training, and utility and long-term costs. What we do know is hot fixed car buses average 208 miles a day, some over 350. A CNG bus can uh, go 400 miles on a full take of fuel. We can get it back in the road between five and eight minutes. And how it does have an on-site direct pop pipeline uh, for CNG back on a, on a CNG backup generator. Next slide. And as far as the timeline, uh, today's committee to review and forward to the full board uh, for November 2nd. Then we would wrap up and finalize details with the TECO partnership. We would issue POs. Uh, early 21, we would, we would uh, complete pre-production pre meetings with vendors and confirm specifications and pricing. The planning, purchase, and installation of the charging infrastructure. Uh, meeting with the Proterra group with engineers and TECO last week. Uh, once they get the green light, they figure uh, from start to finish about eight months to get all infrastructure in place. Uh, permitting was a big question. Uh, then we work with planning to confirm the routes. I do want to mention Ron Giroux is the project manager for HOT assigned to the battery electric bus program. And Ron will schedule and facilitate monthly meetings with, the, with all internal and external stakeholders. Uh, anticipating late first quarter, early second quarter fiscal year 2022, uh, the buses would be delivered. Next slide. And at that time, I'll take any questions or comments. Director McLean, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Scott, um, thank you for the brief. Good brief and very informative. I appreciate it. Um, could I ask you to go back to slide eight and maybe post it on the board here? Since I did have a couple of questions on slide eight, and that's the one that outlines the total cost. 
for each. Uh, I think it was the bus, yes, right there. So, so as I read this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it costs us right now, C&D fleet, uh, 23 cents per C M CPM. But it's going to cost electric 84 cents per CPM. Well, I'm just I'm just stating what South Metro sets are, and so to to compare to get South Metro to be uh, to compare to us with their average efficiency of 2.87, they would have to be paying around eight cents a kilowatt hour to to compare to that 23 cents. Okay, all right. And and, the, and if I'm not mistaken, also, and I don't have that slide in front of me, the electric bus is about twice the cost. Of a CNG bus, I think you showed somewhere around nine hundred thousand for for electric and about five hundred thousand for CNG. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, just under nine hundred twenty-one thousand for electric and around five hundred thirty-three uh, for CNG. Okay, and for and for normal daily use, it, you know, as I looked at that slide you presented for normal daily use, um, it doesn't appear like the electric buses will satisfy our requirements on a normal daily usage. Basis. If you if you look at a hard bus running somewhere between 200 220 on the average per day, and the electric bus, I think you showed one electric bus was getting about 175, although you rounded down to 150, which was the average of the four. Um, it still doesn't support our requirements without substantial downtime. That that's correct. We, we for all the successful deployments of electric vehicles across the country, there's a lot of on route charging and. The strategic, the strategic planning of the routes is really a major factor on a successful deployment. Okay, and, and the, the only thing I didn't see, Scott, was what happens when the buses need to be transferred out, or if we have major battery issues. Is there any any data on that? Well, procuring four buses, we would only put three in service. We'd always keep one uh, for a spare for 100% charge. Our planning is looking at how we could, uh, with an on route charger, the downtime schedule inside the route to get that seven to ten minute charge to keep those buses going. That's actually how Star Metro, uh, their routes are all, they are smaller routes, but they are three on route chargers to keep those buses going every day. Okay, so three, so for us to use a bus in a, in a route that's, let's say, it's running 220 miles, we, we'd actually need two chargers per that route, will we not? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, okay. All right, I, I think, you know, carbon footprint, I, I agree with the environmental issues that, you know, CNG, you know, diesel versus electric. I, I think electric is far better from a, from a carbon footprint point of view, but from an economical operational standpoint, I don't think electric buses are there quite yet. Uh, and so my, my thought process is why would we move forward with something like this when CNG is definitely the option that Hart needs to pursue right now in updating its fleet. So, I mean, and I'm just stating that, Scott, I'm not looking for acknowledgement. I'm just saying from my standpoint, from a fiscal standpoint, from an operational standpoint, um, CNG looks like the way to go for Hart right now. Um, of course, as we, as we get more financially stable, if, if in fact the referendum passes or not passes, I think that's an option, but for right now, with our with our cash strapped balance books, there, I think C and G is the way to go. But that's just it. So, thank you. Thank you, Director McLean. Director Sushla, you're recognized, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm going to echo uh, Mr. McLean's comments. First of all, Scott, good presentation. These are the kind of numbers I've been looking for. When you look at a fully loaded electric bus, like 1.37 million, the variance between a, a fully, fully loaded electric and a fully loaded diesel is $783,000 per bus. So if we're at 16 buses that we're trying to replace now, it'd be $12.5 million. Now, everybody understands the carbon footprint issue. I agree with it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be... Uh, uh, disrespectful to that position, but uh, we got 79 buses that are, um, uh, 79 buses that are, that are, are past its useful life. These are diesel, but you want to get off the road by all means. So we, <clears throat> we're going to take the five electric because we have a matching grant from the, from the, from the 
feds on this. So you, you don't give a, you don't give back grant money. So we're kind of sort of obligated to take the four buses. But seventy five buses is seven hundred eighty three thousand dollars is fifty almost fifty nine million dollars just to get us um, equal and, and just just to put us back to rolling stock that's within its useful life, irrespective of the fact that. Uh, the, the, the electric buses, as, as Mr. McLean said, just don't quite match up to the, to the CNG buses. You 150 or 160 miles on an average route of 204. We're going to have buses that are, you know, running out of running out of power and in, in, in mid-stage uh, recycling recharging stations all day long. And I understand that that, depending upon the the, the heat indexes outside, that that, that useful time period using air conditioner starts to dramatically decrease so you may not even get that that rate so um i uh fully, you know, fully understanding the implications of going to a, a full electric system i know that'd be that'd be nice and it, it's a novel idea but i just don't see it being practical in given as given the current fiscal uh, status and situation, um, you know, go back to go back to normal. Your little odds and ends of like we have full inventory to to repair CNG buses. Um, I'm not sure what technology is going to be required. I don't even know if there's any kind of calculation you can do, you know, for the for the for the differential between maintaining an electric bus versus maintaining the CNG bus just to keep the rolling stock rolling. So. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fully prepared to make a motion, and I'm sure there's other people who want to talk, but I'm prepared to make a motion to move both of these forward to the full board for discussion. But um, I know that uh, at this point, I agree, I don't know how we can ever afford any more electric buses than before that, that were being partially handled by the government, by the, the feds. And I'll stop there. Thank you. There's a motion on the on the floor. Is there a second? Oh, thank you, I'll Director. Kim thank you, Commissioner Overman. Um, uh, Director Camp, you are recognized. Thank you. I'd like to put my date up again, also. <laughs> thank you. Did this presentation change since when you showed it to me? There is. I, had, I did streamline it, and uh, as I got I collected more information, I I did put it in the presentation. Yeah, I I feel disappointed <laughs> by um you know I I thought this is a um a less genuine presentation than was presented to me, and here's my issues with this. First of all, slide eight. You very explicitly you know, have said that you combined, you're not comparing apples to apples, that you put all these things into the electric bus, 84 cents cost per mile, that you did not do with the CNG. So can you list out the things you said, fees, you said some, you know, what, what all is included in the cost per mile for the Tallahassee, and why wasn't all that included in the CNG for um, Hart? Sure. Well, I'm disappointed that you're disappointed. <laughs> but, yeah, so I did not have this uh, information at the time I did the one-on-ones. But I, I would like to say uh, the 23 cents a mile, so we average 74, between 74 and 94 cents uh, per diesel gallon equivalent uh, when it comes to CNG, uh, depending on volume. So that's, that's including uh, the OEM and distribution. So that's all the costs. Um, are in those those actual twenty three cents a mile? What it comes down to? Uh, so seventy seventy four to ninety four cents a mile might be more comparable to the eighty four cents a mile. No, no, it, it, that's per gallon diesel gallon equivalent. So if we're averaging four miles per diesel gallon equivalent, uh, that brings that cost that pretty much way down. Well, you're saying? <laughs> let me understand this again. First of all, when the electric, you said you combined all these other things with that cost per mile. What were all these other things? You spoke of fees, you spoke of whatever. What are the other things that were combined in that? 
and that and that's the biggest the biggest question that so we're talking about talking to the the authorities across the country what they didn't really think about was yeah you could say the average cost the average kilowatt hour plus this not taking into consideration when they're charging the demand the peak what the taxes are the fees and then when they get their first bill they're in shock this is how, this is how I talk to many many uh, transit agents that tell me this so I wanted to compare kind of apples to apples with the electric buses because Tallahassee is the only one that run electric buses in Florida so that's I, actually I, that's not true is it because I think Broward's running them, Gainesville's running them, several other, aren't they running them as well? Broward, well? No, Broward has uh, two on order, Lynx has them on order, and Miami have them on order, but actual in-service, uh, I, I wanted to get real data. Uh, right. I, there's a lot of anecdotal data out there that, you know, says, that says a lot of things. I really want to show what the actual, there's no surprises. This, this right. is what it means. Right, I want to get real data too. But that's why I find this kind of disturbing. The other thing is, first of all, their fleet started in 2008. But And just to say, doesn't Broward have 75 electric buses they're ordering right now? No, they have options for up to 75. But I believe there's only two on our for tariffs. Uh-huh. Okay, because I, I had read something about they're ordering 75. But I'll, I'll maybe have that information. Um, still, the so what... Oh, oh, did you do fees and taxes and cost of infrastructure and all this stuff would seem like the comparable apples to apples for CNG? Well, again, that oh, I took all the fees included. Uh, that's how we get our cost, our diesel gallon equivalent. So depending on where we are at 74 cents or 94 cents, it hasn't been over 94 cents since I've been at heart. Uh, and that's OEM, that's operations, maintenance, that's distribution. All those fees are in... Uh, that 94 cents. Okay, so 94 cents a mile. No, no. no 94 cents per diesel gallon equivalent equivalents to four miles. Four miles per gallon. Okay. And w what is the um, electric equivalent to a gallon it's in two, terms of the cost? Two, two kilowatt hours is equivalent is the equivalent of that uh, of four miles per gallon. So when you look at when you look at Foothill, uh, who's who's had been for ten years, their average kilowatt hour is seventeen cents. But when you equivalent it to the C and G cost, that's over six dollars to do the gallon. Okay, I'm gonna look at this more. Um, I mean the huge reason that these these places are willing to pay more is not because they're, they're helping the climate. It's because the long-term costs are paid off in a short period of time, um, as well with repair, which was talked about, that the repairs are so negligible and, and, so, and because you have so many fewer parts and, you, ha and the, you know, the battery replacement and tires are like the complete... <laughs> Uh, you know, what's at, what's at risk for replacement? Uh, what is the issue? So, I mean, I'm wondering uh, with that, with regards to that, too. I just, um, you know, this feels, um, this doesn't feel as the presentation at all um, that I was given. It's, it's very different in terms of this, and I would have liked to have uh, seen this as well if this was going to be what was presented, because I... Uh, I, it doesn't strike me as apples to apples in this, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that later. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner. Yes. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry. Were you finishing your thought? My apologies. Yeah. Um, if we could put that back up again, the slide still. Because okay, so the, second, uh, the second issue about it was the um, length of our... Um, Okay. One of which I, in, in general, because we keep doing these trips to Pasco County that, that are costing us, but a huge thing in Los Angeles at Foothills was, and th that is noted, is that you really have trips um, that are over the, um, uh, now, also the range is extending year by year by year, so we're comparing again to buses that were first in 2008, the technologies extending incredibly. 
but the um, the trips also, for the most part, all of uh, the trips that other agencies, including Los Angeles, found were like 98% were under the range for a day. So that was another uh, issue that was brought up by others. And my third question is this. You said both inside and outside stakeholders would be consulted with regard to where these uh, buses are used. What outside stakeholders? I think it's more decision. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, the I just wondered what uh, external stakeholders you met. Oh, Zico. Oh, okay. That's it? Yes, yeah, so as, as of right now, Zico is the only external stakeholder. So, yeah. Commissioner okay, Kim. And the, the, the only final thing I'd like to say um, is this, is that these can be solar powered and they are all over the place. Are the people are purchasing their own panels and putting up stations to power them mostly. Um, and once you do the investment in that, again, you're doing huge cost savings because you're no longer even, um, you know, uh, purchasing um, uh, uh, fuel. So to speak. So anyway, that was just my final comment. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kemp. What, uh, we have a motion on the floor by D Director Schisler and second by Director Overman. Uh, we will uh, vote at this time. And I, I, I need, just need to ask a clarifying question from Julia Mandel that when we move this, if this is passed to the full board, we could ask Mr. Drainville for a more detailed overview of of this plan to answer Commissioner Kemp's questions. Is that correct? That is, oh, let me, let me mute. Am I unmuted? No, I'm not. You're, you're unmuted. You are unmuted. Okay, I am unmuted. Um, yes, that would be uh, the proper process at this point given the, the conversation and questions that are coming up today and only knowing that to, to be moved to the full board for uh, any additional discussion on a consent. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle, will you uh, take a vote, please? Yes. Do you want me to do both motions? Yeah, both, if you don't mind. Thank you. So this is the voting for both motions. Please say yes or no after your name is called. Chair Williams? Yes. Director Kemp? No. Dir Director McLean? Yes. Director Mechanic? Uh, we are both, I, I need clarification. The motion is to advance both the CFG and the electric buses to the full board. We're not, is that correct? That is correct, sir. We are voting on both of the action, the committee action items to forward them to the board. So we are still continuing to propose the electric buses and I will vote yes, okay. Director Overman? Yes, and I have a comment before we move to the next agenda item. Director Schisler? Yes. Both the motion passes five to one. Thank you. Um, excuse me. I will <laughs> thank you for the clarification. I really don't think we should have voted on both those items together, but I heard you say the two items, but I'll change mine to yes. But I think that was inappropriate to put them both together like that. Thank you for your feedback. And Ms. Mandel, do, do we need to do anything different as a result of what we've done at this point? I mean, if the, if the issue is just whether or not you can take them both together or to move them forward to the board or, or you have to take them independently, that's really a decision of, the, of this committee to, to make in terms of putting them both together for the action. But they will be listed as separate items on the full board agenda. Thank you. Danielle, for the purpose of the records, would you read the motion that Director Schistler, excuse me, Director McLean made initially? I'm uh, sorry, it was, the, member, it was Director Schistler. Yes, committee member Schistler made a motion to approve the two action items that were, um, that accompanied this presentation, which was action item B, which was the, I apologize, action item B, 
B, which was to authorize the interim chief executive officer to purchase up to 16 40 foot compressed natural gas CNG powered heavy duty transit buses from Gillick LLC in a not to exceed amount of $9,413,485. And then action items or committee action item C, which was authorized the interim chief executive officer to purchase up to four 40 foot Proterra battery electric buses with charging equipment and requisite charging infrastructure and an ought to exceed amount for $5,485,350. And with the change um, of committee member Kemp's vote, we now have it passing unanimously six to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kemp. Your point is noted. Thank you. Uh, we are 34 minutes, 37 minutes beyond our time, and we still have three action items uh, that are, are supposed to be covered. Is there a way to get this done in a couple of minutes, or is this going to take extensive time for the next three? There's no more presentation. Okay, so. Quick introduction. Okay. Um, um, committee operation safety committee if we could bear with me to move forward on the last three please all right so this is Justin, Justin Loeffler director of maintenance will pr present the action item authorize the interim CEO to dispose of seven fixed route buses 33 paratramp voted vans and 12 non-revenue vehicles in such a manner to be most advantageous to heart Mr. Laffler, you're recognized. Good, Good morning. Madam Chair, uh, Jeff Laffler, Director of Maintenance. So this action item, just like you just read, is to dispose of buses that uh, vans and non-revenue vehicles that have met their useful life. All but one of these um, vehicles didn't meet the useful life. Uh, 1708 was in, in an accident and was deemed a total loss. And we're requesting to move this to the the, the full board meeting on November 2nd. I'll, I'll move approval. This is the CANIC. Thank you. We have a, a motion by Mr. Mechanic and second by Dr. Director Swishler. Danielle, will you take a vote, please? Yes, please say yes or no after your name is called. Chair Williams? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Mechanic? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schistler? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next action item is being introduced by Dwayne Brown, Project Manager 1, Manager 1 authorized the interim CEO to award a contract for construction services to DMAR General Contracting for the construction of two bus bays with shelter pads and two landing pads at Orient Road adjacent to the Florida State Fairgrounds and Orient Road at Cayuga Street in the amount of 123 it's thousand seven hundred eleven dollars and sixteen cents plus a contingency of twelve thousand three hundred seventy one dollars twelve cents for a total amount not to exceed one hundred thirty six thousand eighty two dollars and twenty eight cents. Move approval. Thank you. Second. <coughs> Thank you. We have an approval by Director Overman and Director McLean is second. If Danielle, will you take a vote, please? Absolutely, Chair Williams. Yes. Director Kemp. Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Mechanic? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schistler? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The last action item on the agenda is the approval of the fourth extension of the memorandum of understanding between HART and PSTA for collaborative for collaboration opportunities. Lena Pettit, I will hand it over to you for discussion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the Operations Safety Committee. Uh, in front of you is extension. It's a fourth extension of the Memorandum of Understanding that was uh, initially signed between Hart and our sister agency in the Pinellas County PSTA on October 31st of 2016. Uh, the, it's an annual approval. Uh, of this um, memorandum of understanding. The only difference between the previous version is that we are 
and we, meaning heart and PSTA staff, also uh, I need to note that PSTA staff is also taking this item uh, in agreement as presented to you today, redlined version, to their committee this month in October for the board's approval in November. So we are kind of on the same schedule for this. The only difference again between the third extension, the current extension, and the one that we are proposing today is that we are adding a clause making this memorandum of understanding uh, evergreen or, or with annual automatic renewals unless either party decides to cancel it. Thank you. I have a problem. Second, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Overman, did you say you had a problem or you are? No, I moved. Okay, to thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, approved by the co Director Overman and second by Director Schisler. Danielle, will you please take a vote? Yes, ma'am. Chair Williams? Yes. Director Kemp? Yes. Director McLean? Yes. Director Mechanic? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. Director Schisler? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, just before we close and ask for our old business and new business, I uh, will work with uh, staff to make sure we have the appropriate amount of time for the activities that we have on our agenda. We did that this previous time and see we had more discussion. They were very worthwhile and necessary. And I thank you for staying with us and we will take that as an action item. Okay, is there any old business? Um, this uh, chair, I'd like to. I had, I had a question for Mr. Drainhill that I'd like to make sure he includes in his presentation when he brings this to the board. If if I may. Yes, you are recognized. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Drainhill. When you did provided us with a report and you indicated average miles, what I'd like to you to include in the report to the main board is the number of routes that are under 150 miles per day. Um, when you have some routes that are 350 and an average of 208, it does appear as though we may have some routes that would be appropriate for the four electric buses that could be utilized. They may be in dense areas where climate you know, and environmental sustainability issues are of paramount concern. And I think we can probably get where we need to go in utilizing both the CNG buses as well as the electric buses going forward. And I'd love to see that included in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Thank you. Director Thank Overman. You. Thank you. Any new business at this time? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.